Ransomware is arguably today's most prolific cyber threat. This can cause a problem for small and medium-sized enterprises that don't have the internal resources or expertise to know where to start. Fortunately, the Institute for Security and Technology created the Ransomware Task Force to address the emerging national and economic security risk posed by ransomware. One of the many outcomes of this is the Blueprint for Ransomware Defense. It's a clear, actionable framework through which SMEs can defend against ransomware. The heart of the Blueprint consists of a subset of safeguards found in version 8 of the CIS Critical Security Controls. The group of safeguards is referred to as Implementation Group 1 and represents a minimum standard of information security for all enterprises. This is referred to as essential cyber hygiene. The 14 foundational safeguards are the building blocks that are necessary to establish an enterprise's cybersecurity program. They also enable the implementation of actionable safeguards. The 26 actionable safeguards build on the foundational ones and are all about applying the technical controls needed to protect an enterprise's environment and defend against ransomware and other general non-targeted cyber attacks. Focusing on seven major areas, the Blueprint helps defend against over 70% of the attack techniques associated with ransomware. The Blueprint for Ransomware Defense would not be possible without the hard work of several contributing organizations. To download the Blueprint and take the steps needed to defend against ransomware, visit the IST website. Hello everyone and welcome. My name is Belisha Stochetti. I'm a senior cybersecurity engineer with the CIS controls team at the Center for Internet Security. I'm also one of the principal authors of the Blueprint for Ransomware Defense and I will be the moderator for today's webinar. We're here today for our fourth webinar in this five-part series that walks through the Blueprint for Ransomware Defense. And in webinar two, we talked about the foundational processes that are needed to help enterprises protect against ransomware, specifically relating to incident response. So today we're going to talk about the actions and processes that an organization must perform to respond efficiently and effectively to an incident. Specifically in the blueprint, we're going to talk about the actionable safeguards that re relate to response and recovery. We have a great panel lined up for you today. We have Adnan Baikal, Daniel Cuthbert, and Debbie Blythe, who I'll formally introduce in just a few minutes. But first, I want to give a little bit of a background on this effort. So the, the Blueprint for Ransomware Defense Working Group was formed as a result of the original Ransomware Task Force's report published in April of 2021. And that report provided several recommendations on ransomware, one of them to be uh, create a clear, actionable framework for ransomware response, mitigation, and recovery. So the Blueprint for Ransomware Defense was born out of this call to action with a specific goal of developing a set of easily achievable safeguards. And with most things in security, nothing is de designed in a vacuum. Uh, we couldn't have done it without countless uh, volunteers and organizations that have helped review and provide their support for the blueprint. And okay, so for those who don't know, the blueprint uh, is a subset of essential cyber hygiene safeguards from the CIS Critical Security Controls version eight. And if you can go to the next slide, Awesome, thank you. So for those who may not know what the controls are, uh, there's a set of prioritized best practice recommendations that defend against the most common attacks. And what I like most about the blueprint is it provides a path for organizations to follow, setting them up for success and not being overwhelmed. The blueprint consists of 40 safeguards that are aimed at small and medium sized enterprises. And to make it more consumable, they are broken down into 14 foundational and 26 actionable safeguards. And the safeguards themselves have been selected not only for their ease of implementation, but also the effectiveness in defending against ransomware attacks. So uh, there's seven major areas that we cover in the blueprint. You can see them up on the screen and they range, they cover a broad spectrum of activities anywhere from asset management all the way up to incident response. Next slide. Okay. So now I'd like to uh, introduce our panelists. So first we have Debbie Blythe. Uh, I already introduced myself, so I won't do that again. Uh, Debbie Blythe is the executive strategist at CrowdStrike. She was formerly the chief information security officer for seven years at the state of Colorado and has over 25 years of experience in technology and information security. She also served on the MSISAC executive committee, and I've had the pleasure of personally knowing Deb for the past several years uh, at the MSISAC, and it's been an honor to have her uh, joining us here today. Next is Daniel Cuthbert, who is the Global Head of Cybersecurity Research at Banco Santander. 
He has a career spanning over 20 years on both offensive and defensive sides. He's the original co-author of the OWASP testing guide released in 2003, and he's now the co-author of the OWASP application security verification standard. He also sits on the UK Government Cybersecurity Advisory Board, and welcome, Daniel. We're happy to hear, have you here today. And last but not least, we have Adnan Bakal, who is the co-founder and chief executive officer for CyberWA. Previously, he was the global technical advisor for the Global Cyber Alliance, where he was the product owner of Quad9, which is a free DNS, uh, secure DNS service. Over the years, he's served in several roles in operations, security services, and incident response at the Center for Internet Security. He built out the Elber IDS solution that's still in existence today. And welcome, Adnan. All right, so today we're gonna to discuss a, a lot of topics. Um, some of them are gonna be how to test and optimize your IR processes, who to contact should an incident occur, best practices for collecting and storing logs, and how to optimize data backup and recovery efforts. So we'll jump right into it, and I'm going to kick off the call with you, Debbie. Um, you've had quite a tenure at the CISO for, as CISO for the state of Colorado. Can you tell me a little bit about some of the challenges you faced regarding incident response and maybe one of the more notable incidents that you've handled? Yeah, uh, great question. So as you mentioned earlier, I was the CISO for the state of Colorado for seven years. Um, my last year was last year. Um, and in 2018, one of our agencies, the Colorado Department of Transportation, had a ransomware attack that took its business operations offline. There were approximately 2,000 systems that were encrypted. Um, so this was close to 1,200 workstations, and every single business application was affected because either the server or the database that supported that application was encrypted. So it was hugely impactful. Um, I will say, though, that there were a few things we had in our favor we had good network segmentation, so that kept the malware, the ransomware, from spreading into the traffic operations environments, so the residents of our state were still safe on the highways, fortunately. Um, it also prevented the ransomware from spreading into any other state agency. So another thing that worked in our favor was we had good backups. So this meant we were able to recover 100% of the production data. And it also meant that we never had to consider paying the ransom. Something else that we had in our favor, we had a very good incident response plan in place. And we had practiced this plan many, many times, including with our key incident response partners. And because of this, we were able to recover CDOT a lot faster than anyone thought would be possible. And I really do think that because of the way we responded, it made the difference in me being able to keep my job. Now, I will mention as well that even small organizations can have an incident response plan. Um, so it really does start with talking to the business about what is important to them and then planning how you will respond when those systems or the system supporting important business functions become unavailable for any reason. And part of this, of course, involves um, determining who your incident response partners will be and then continuing to build and refine those relationships and practice responding together. Yeah, I, uh, I definitely remember the CDOT incident and I, I know what a massive undertaking it was to respond to. So thank you for sharing that story with us. Um, and I think at one point, didn't you say that somebody was even, was it you or somebody else running meals to people? <laughs> or was it the National Guard? Yeah, um, before, so before the Office of Emergency Management and the Colorado National Guard showed up, um, it was up to myself or our chief technology officer or our chief operations officer or director of infrastructure to provide meals for folks. And, you know, of course, at first there were five people on site working long hours, and then there were, you know, seven, then there were 12, and then there were 13 and then there were, you know, it ballooned upwards. And by day three, our team absolutely refused to eat any more pizza. And so then it was up to us to just sort of run all over town and try to figure out, you know, some new type of meal that they hadn't eaten before and get, you know, food and cups and plasticware and plates and everything else to feed all of these people on site. And that was literally what I was spending the most of my time doing. So I was super 
excited when Office of Emergency Management showed up and started coordinating logistics because then I was able to focus on incident response. <laughs> right. Yeah. Well, I can imagine. I mean, it's uh, I think it shows the resiliency, right, to, to just kind of throw down and, and do whatever you have to do when you have to do it. And <laughs> no questions asked. Um, Daniel, I'd like to turn it over to you. So you've also had a lot of experience with responding to incidents of all kinds. Uh, what kind? What thoughts do you have on incident response and the importance of planning and reporting those incidents? I think in my experience, what I've noticed in the past is that when the incident happens, a lot of people are completely taken by surprise. Mm -hmm. And really simple things like having a list of up-to-date phone numbers. Um, a lot of people throw that out. They think, okay, well, I'll just get hold of them on Teams or Slack or something else. Well, that's gone. So then you go back to this old-fashioned thing called a phone with a number. And people are like, oh, my God, how do I get hold of this person? So it's like little things like that that I think a lot of us have taken for granted with the, you know, plethora of chat clients and the ways we get hold of people. When that disappears, we've got to go back to basics. So I think that's the first thing. And then in an instant, everybody wants to get involved. It's human nature. We want to fix things. We want to do the cool things. And that becomes more of a hindrance than good because you almost need a plan to say, right, your job is just to do this. Right, and put it over there. Your job is to do that. And like Debbie said, you need that coordinator. And I think a lot of people, when it comes to incidents, forget about these basics because you know it's just assumed. When in reality, when everything disappears, it's like, wow, we actually need these practices. Yeah, I uh, I think my favorite story of my own personal experience was when I uh, it was probably only like six years ago. I had to fax my case updates. For a case because everything was down and <laughs> we were like trying to figure out how to use a fax machine which is so embarrassing right it's like how could you forget to use a fax machine but if you don't use it right but um yeah <laughs> wow <laughs> yes exactly wow that's all you can say to that <laughs> um so Adnan I I'd like to hear your thoughts on you know you've cultivated a lot of relationships over the years with your role, previous roles and your current role. Um, let's talk about communication and the importance of building those relationships, especially when it comes to using third parties to handle the IR process. I mean, I think uh, we, we can't speak enough about building an incident response plan and having those plans and exercising it. But you know, part of that plan is uh, doing capability assessment, you really need to understand your capabilities. And as uh, as David said, it is not, you know, it's it's not it's not shameful to not have certain capabilities. Not, I mean, incident response is about the teamwork, and that team is uh, you have to consider it as a large sort of community effort, and you have to build your own community. You have to be part of a community we have you know we have a great community that we've been uh, part of multi-state isaac right this multi-state isaac has a lot of a lot of uh, capabilities but part of incident response is understanding your capabilities identifying gaps and then going out and building those relationships to fulfill those gaps and not being selfish that's extremely important you will get hit you will have an incident you will need external help this is you know, there is no doubt about that. So you cannot be selfish. When things are going well for you, go out and help others in your community. Share more than you give and you get. So if you know, if, if you're getting little and you have certain indicators, share with your community. Cultivate those relationships when things are you know going well. And then when incident happens, tap into those relationships to you know quickly recover from that incident. Because it's going to happen, and your your relationships are going to be the key to determining the uh, sort of the recovery time for your incident. Yeah, I I could not agree more. Um, I think the the other thing too to point out is for some people who think that the IR process is intimidating. I mean, you just have to start somewhere. I, I think it was Daniel, right, that said just look at your phone and and get the phone numbers, but. You know, even more than that, like get out a piece of paper, right? I mean, unless the building's on fire, the, pa the paper's going to be there for, for you know, when you need to use it. And just start writing down numbers and emails and set up an email that your employees can use to report the incidents. 
um, those things are quick wins and they don't have to be overly complex, right? Nobody, um, everyone can write down, hopefully, you know, have some kind of communication to to get the phone numbers to, to whoever they need to be. Um, and the other thing too, is that, you know, when you aren't prepared and you're left to scramble during the incident, that's when things go crazy, right? It's, it's the, <laughs> Debbie shaking your head, yes. Because <clears throat> it's true. Um, does anyone have any other thoughts before we move to backups on incident response or, or anything, any uh, advice or? Yeah, I mean, I think Debbie hit, hit it on the head that you have, to, you have to exercise these plans. Having a plan is great, but keep exercising it. Keep, you know, and th this, has, this doesn't have to be a large coordinated exercise effort that you can only pull once a year. You know, do little tabletops, you know, every other week. Just, you know, hey, guys, what would happen if, you know, such thing happens? Just just run hypothetical scenarios in your head for 10 minutes, 15 minutes. And you don't have to solve every problem in every exercise, but just make that a habit. And eventually what is going to happen is it's going to be a reflexive uh, response from your incident responders. When something happens, oh, we already talked about that. This is how we do it. Yeah. I agree with that, Ben. I'd also probably add... Don't feel pressured to have to call out to an external IR firm. Um, a lot of the time they're expensive and they would have the same problem that you would have. They would need to come in and understand how you work. Whereas you would have the, the, you know, the ability to say, well, actually, we know that already. You know, when it actually does hit the fan, you want to say, right, we tested this as I said, and Debbie said, we know what we're doing. If at a later stage you want to go down some kind of law enforcement route, yes, that's when you call them in. But initially be, hey, Keep it small and just test it all the time. Asking those, yeah. if it happened, yeah, like, can we fix it? Yeah, um, fully agree. Um, and one of the things that I was thinking about is both of you talked a little bit about those partnerships and relationships and also internal contacts. And one of the things that I realized that we needed to do more frequently is update our contact list. So, you know, maybe monthly go through that list and say, are those people still in that those roles? And, you know, maybe I have a new cell phone number that I need to put on that list. So that's just something that it's really smart to revisit that frequently and continue to, you know, touch base with those individuals, make sure they're still in the same roles. Yeah, and there's also a question um, from one of our uh, attendees. It's actually for you, Debbie. So prior to the CDOT incident, did they do tabletop exercises? And then um, after, did they take cyber more seriously, which I sure hope the answer is yes. Yeah. And did they perform tabletop exercises more frequently? Yeah. Hi, Jim. Thanks for the question. Um, yeah. Actually, we did do tabletop exercises uh, like twice a year with the Colorado National Guard, who were sort of our key incident response partners. Um, and we did take them seriously at the time. But I will say that after the incident, you are absolutely right that we took them much more seriously. And we also incorporated some of the lessons that we learned. Um, so for example, we discovered that in our tabletop exercises, we were involving mainly uh, IT folks and communications, but we were not involving the business. And so it really didn't occur to us that the business might actually have different priorities than we had. So when we were trying to bring up the Active Directory servers, for example, um, because that's what we use for authentication and we're trying to bring up the SCCM server so that we could you know, push out patches and software, the business was saying, we need you to bring up our financial system. And we're like, you know, we need these systems. And they're saying we need these systems. And so one of the things that we realized is from now on, we need to be including various agencies and agency participation into the tabletop exercise so that we can take into account their differing priorities and how we're going to work through and negotiate those during an actual incident. Um, and I will say, you know, you hit the nail on the head. After an incident, agencies take this much more seriously and they want to be involved and they're much more inclined to listen to you going forward um, when you say, you know, this could cause or if we don't do this, we are opening ourselves up for these types of risk. They're suddenly listening and paying better attention. 
Yeah, absolutely. Um, and we actually have another question from a, a attendee is that, do you have uh, recommendations for effective tabletop exercises? Adnan, do you have any thoughts on, on that? I mean, I, 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 you know, uh, I, I think you're in a better uh, position to answer that question because I think <laughs> uh, CIS has great, I mean, CIS and multi-state ISAC uh, has started building uh, mini tabletop exercise sort of scenarios that members can access. But yeah. also there are, there are, you know, I tell you this table, don't make tabletops complicated. Just do a Google search for, you know, previous year's cybersecurity incidents and just say, what would happen if this happened to me? You know, uh, it's going to be a ransomware. It's going to be phishing. It's going to be your website going down. It will be a malware, in, you know, infection. There are a ton of incidents out there that you can just say, what if that happened to us? And then just run from it. Yep. I, I agree so much. Keep it simple. You don't want to have this complex multi-layered type thing. It's a you know, perfect example. Hey, we are a European company. We've got PII data. Unfortunately, we need to maybe get the lawyers involved. Does anybody want to speak to the lawyers? There's the tabletop thing, right? Just keep it very, very simple and expand it from there. Yeah. We, we do have uh, resources on cisecurity.org that Adnan had mentioned with the tabletop. So definitely check those out. And if you are a state or local government, we have um, we obviously partner with CISA and CISA has a lot of tabletop exercises that they do throughout the, the year. So, um, okay, let's pivot to backups uh, to make sure we, we keep on track and get all the, the good nuggets of information. So Daniel, we all know backups are important. Certainly we don't need to rehash that, but can you share your thoughts on, you know, maybe what happens when those backups aren't executed properly and what your advice to small businesses are who might just be getting started with uh, or in the process of actually setting up their backups? Yeah, so backups are boring. They're, they're boring IT. <laughs> oh, we lost your, your audio, Daniel. Okay, so Daniel's going to work on his audio. We'll give him a minute to, to figure that out. Um, while we're waiting, we'll, we'll switch over to you, Debbie. So um, what about your thoughts on backups and maybe some, some tips and uh, tricks that organizations can do to protect those backups? Sure. Um, yeah, so tips and tricks. Uh, obviously, you want to have your backups offline. You don't want them connected because that's one of the things that we've discovered the ransomware attackers will do is they get in, they sort of bounce around, they look for your backups, and they want to delete those first. So uh, make sure they are offline. Um, one of the things that happened to us is when our incident response partner showed up, the first thing they asked us for was a network diagram, which is, you know, sounds reasonable. Um, I noticed that our team actually left the room. They went and they found the primary network administrator. They brought him in. They brought in an easel and a huge pad of paper. And he began drawing the network by memory. So drawing it out. And so I went to someone on the team and I said, surely we have network diagrams, right? And it was then that they told me that the server that the network diagrams were on had been encrypted with a ransomware. Um, so as part of our after action report, we made it a goal to kind of go and revisit all of that documentation that we might need during a security incident and make sure that we had copies of these stored in an appropriate secondary location. So might be in approved cloud storage, for instance, so that these would be available when needed. So definitely in addition to thinking about, you know, the systems you need to back up, the applications you need to back up, also think about an any documentation that you might need that might be critical during an incident, make sure you're backing that up as well. Yeah, absolutely. Um, the uh, <laughs> the backups being encrypted is, is a big thing, right? So that always used to happen to us as we'd ask for documentation, and then lo and behold, it was encrypted with the rest of the, <laughs> the documents that they needed. And it was like, okay, 
Yeah. It did not occur to me that that would happen. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, I thought about later where we were storing our incident response plans. And I thought, what if same thing? What if those were on systems that were on site that had been encrypted? And how on earth would we execute our incident response plan? So fortunately, that was in cloud storage. Um, and so we didn't have an issue accessing that. But network diagrams, never thought about that. Yeah, it, it's funny you say that because recently I was working on a project where I was reviewing a document and the, the document was uh, saying you should print out things. And I was like, well, that seems archaic. I had like a flighting moment and I said, you know, just have it digital. And then I thought to myself, nope, definitely print out things <laughs> and make sure that you have them at hand or on hand if you uh, if you need them. Um, and, and then how about you? I and mean, we haven't talked about encryption and automation yet, but did what are your thoughts on on backups and maybe some of those areas? I, I, I want to take a step back and uh, yeah. stress the importance of what something that we said. Uh, priorities in the organization are different depending on different departments. And uh, I mean, cybersecurity is a it's, it's not an IT problem anymore. It's a it's a it's a business problem, mm -hmm. and as, as, a, as a business problem, business decisions, major business decisions has to be made at the executive leadership level. So uh, the risks have to be defined, identified, and then based on that, that's actually going to drive your backup strategy. What are the critical things that I need to have? Obviously, incident response plans, network diagrams are important, but also when you're bringing up systems, what, what are the priorities of the systems that you are going to bring up? You know, your IT system, IT may think that, you know, it's the mail server that has to come up first because I need to be able to communicate with my staff. But your business people may say, you know what, we need our website up. That, that website cannot be down because that's what drives our business. So it's very important to have that, you know, a sort of leadership view into the, the risk assessment and have that drive your backups. And when you do the backups, you know, if, if we talked about... Uh, Encryption is, is funny, you know, encrypt your backup before your attackers encrypt them, right? They, because they, they will get encrypted one way or another. You may, you know, you, you may want to encrypt it first and, <laughs> and, and have it offline, have it off site, right? That's, 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 that's critical. Uh, you know, for most organizations, it may not be possible to have an off site backup, but at least have offline backups, encrypt them. And encryption is not only going to give you privacy, but it's also going to give you the integrity, right? So when you're bringing the systems back up, you know that you can rely on that set of images because they haven't been tampered with. You know, decryption keys are working. You can actually restore from those. And then practice that. Practice that once in a while because so many times our, environment is, our environments are so dynamic that the environments change. We constantly add servers, remove servers, and we, we forget yeah. about backups. We're like, oh, you know, we haven't been backing up that that you know new Windows server for the last you know six months. And unfortunately, you you find out about that when incidents happen, and that's yes. the first time to find up you know find out that your backup wasn't functioning. So constantly yeah. review what you are backing up. You know that's important because things are gonna fall through cracks. You're gonna forget that system, and you know it is it's that rule, right? If 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 there is that one system that you're gonna need that you haven't been backing up, that's the system that you will rely on to bring everything back up. So yeah. it's uh, it's important to constantly review what you are logging, and then making sure that you know the integrity is uh, verified through encryption. Yeah, smart. Daniel, do we have you back yet? Ah, oh, no. I still can't hear you. <laughs> okay, we will come back Shoot. to Daniel. Yeah, Daniel, keep trying and just interrupt me if you can get <laughs> if you can get it working. Is that any better? Oh yes, I can hear oh, you. Oh yeah. my goodness, computers are amazing. Okay. <laughs> he was executing his incident response, a live demo. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Um. All right. Well, we're still on backups, and I want to hear. Literally, when we first started talking, you and and I first met you, you talked about a portable hard drive. So I, I want to hear your thoughts on backups and keeping so, it simple. <laughs> hopefully, this works. Um, I get that backups are very boring. 
uh, and they are right. And, like nobody thinks of backups anymore, but they're really useful. And I, I'm of the the age now where there's my backup solution, multiple drives because this is hack proof, right? And I found that a lot of SMEs either rely heavily on a backup serverless from the same network, and sometimes it falls in the cracks, or they don't do offline backups. Now, in the 90s and early 2000s, that's something that we did when we were building the first .com, where every Friday you would run a backup to a tape drive, and then it was actually my job to drive that to somewhere else. Yeah. We didn't save storage. We seem to have moved away from that. We've got this lovely idea that, well, we can do it in the cloud, we can push stuff up, we'll save the key in a password manager on the machine itself, and hey, it just happens. But the reality is, is that those same weaknesses are what a lot of the ransomware groups aren't known to look for. So I think a lot of times SMEs could really benefit from going back to a disk. And these are really cheap now. I mean, I still get fascinated that this is a two terabyte disk, like it's the whole internet. Um, but it's really good because if you get that mindset of these are the boxes I want to back up. And yeah, let's just, I don't know, do periodically twice a month, throw it onto disk and somebody put it into a safe somewhere. I found that in a vast majority of cases I've been involved in, that would have saved a lot of anguish. Yeah. And I would say also um, a couple of things there. Number one, you're right. That is that is the foolproof way to make sure your backup is has integrity and is not affected by ransomware. But one of the things that we discovered at CDOT is we had individuals who had workstations who had backup drives connected and they just left them connected at all times. And so um, it was really easy for the attacker when they, uh, you know, spread their encryption to the workstation. It also spread to the backup drive. And so their backup wasn't uh, any better than their primary machine. So if that is your strategy, just make sure that after you can after you finish the backup, disconnected. It's that easy. Um, and then the other thing is I once worked for a person who she loved that as a backup strategy, but she kept that drive in her laptop bag with her computer. And, you know, she said, I said, well, what's, what's the risk there? And she said, well, what if somebody steals my computer? And I said, well, chances are they're not going to go into your laptop bag, open it up, unzip it, right? And grab your computer and just take your computer and leave your laptop bag and your backup uh, drive. So make sure that you're storing them in two separate places. I liked your idea of put it in a safe. Um, because the other thing is you don't want to lose that if it has sensitive data on it. Now you could be opening yourself up to a breach as well. So I think just a couple of things to think about there uh, with regard to the backup strategy and make sure that you are, if you're an individual contributor, that you're discussing this with your organization to make sure that what you are doing for a backup strategy is in accordance with the organization's security policies. Yeah. Yeah. I, I would also stress too, and we haven't talked too much about it, but if an incident does happen, as far as more of an actionable thing, make sure that when you're using your backups to recover from, that you're recovering from a known good backup. We always say that, but what it really means is don't get reinfected, right? Because there are chances of recovering from a backup that wasn't stored in a safe, right? And that clearly was not touched by any means because it wasn't connected to the network. If you have a backup server or whatever that's doing live backups and you recover from one of those or a certain restore point, there's a possibility if you can't identify the root cause and the exact time it happened that you're going to reinfect yourself. Um, so that's another thing to, to keep in mind. There's, there's a really good story from the CISO of Maersk when they were hit by ransomware. Um, he gave it at Black Hat a couple of years ago. It was fascinating. So Maersk got hit by ransomware, massive ship the company. It fell down that they didn't exist on the internet and a lot of the internal networks were down. They were scrambling because they didn't really have a backup until they found one sole active directory in Africa that was two days behind the sink. And that was the sole clean AD that hadn't been infected. And it was somebody's job to fly out and pick up this single machine and fly it back. And the way that he was telling the story, you can just imagine this you know, G.I. Joe mission of somebody flying in parachute and getting this one box, this holy grail of it's not been touched. Um, and it was weird. You think like, well, surely they, they haven't. And it was just a fascinating insight as to we often overlook the really basic things. And for me, that's always been ransomware's great thing. It's 
they look at the basics that weren't done. It's, there's nothing fancy about ransomware. You know, it's not this nation state monster with 19 eyes. It's a, you forgot to do this one thing and it's going to hurt now. Yep, absolutely. Um, there are a couple of questions, but I think for the sake of time, I want to make sure we hit on logging and then we'll come right back to those questions and make sure they get answered. Um, so Adnan, I'd like to get your thoughts on logging and what small organizations can do to help with that burden, because as we all know, logging can be a burden at times. <laughs> I mean, for, for honestly, I, you know, we've been, even when I was at GCA, we've been uh, sort of banging our head against the wall about how to help small businesses with logging because logging requires technical some level of technical expertise uh, some level of sort of incident response sort of mentality because you want to be able to log things that will allow you to sort of answer you know who when what where uh, questions and you can't do that without the logs so if you are uh, if, if if you don't have the cyber security or incident response expertise you know, it's, it's better to find a third party that can help you with that. I mean, logging and backups, sort of they are, in my head, they are going uh, sort of in parallel. You need to be able to log things, but you can't log everything because of the limitations of storage. And you just don't want to log anything. You want to log meaningful things. So when you are doing that, there are, there are third party services that you can utilize that you can just install agents on. You know, if you are a small business, if you are a, if you are a small organization, you can you can install these agents on your computer. That's going to do the backups for you. Uh, as for the logging, you know, I think for the least you want to log things at the perimeter, right? You wanna you wanna you wanna have your firewall logs. You wanna have your you know proxy logs if you have proxies. Um, you know, I, I wouldn't go down to like Windows event logs. If, unless you have the capability, that's great. But at least have those you know, critical network perimeter logs um, stored somewhere and make sure that your logs are uh, time syncing so that when you are putting the timeline together, it actually makes sense to you. So um, I think that's where I would start. And then it's, 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 it's a journey. I mean, you will, depending on maturity and size of your organization, you will identify things that you will have to log uh, that you can use for incident response. But I think it's very difficult to say, you know, do A, B, and C other than the perimeter. Perimeter, you know, what leaves your organization network, what comes into your organization network, at least have those and use that as a starting point. And then you can actually use that information to sort of drive rest of your incident response. The other thing I may, I may add is, and that's coming from experience, DHCP logs, right? Your IPs are constantly changing. And, you know, um, being able to identify a machine in your internal network reliably through DHCP logs is invaluable yeah. when you're doing response. Yeah, for sure. I, um, I could not agree more. Um, Daniel, what are your some of your thoughts on log management and maybe which logs, you know, Adnan touched on which logs he thinks, but are there any logs you think would be valuable uh, and maybe around the configuration of logs? Because we all know death by logging is a thing. <laughs> yeah, I think there's that danger at the moment where we've logged everything and then you're left with, okay, what am I looking for? Um, some of the little things I've noticed we don't log anymore um, are amounts of data going out of the network. Mm. So you hear these stories of attackers pushing out a terabyte of data over three days. Like, wow, that's that should be one hell of a spike on a graph somewhere, right? A lot of people don't love that. And I think we've become quite in love with the fact that the internet and our pipes are all very fast now and it costs nothing, so why would you love that? Uh, so that's the first thing. The other thing is looking at some of the most recent attacks that we've seen ransomware groups do is once they've compromised the network, they all seem to go to a speed test website to test the download and upload speed. And then straight after that, they see if they can access the uh, file sharing sites, such as Mega. So for me, that's like a good telltale indicator that if you see these two happen within a certain time, something's very amiss here. Unless your company's constantly doing network speed tests, which possibly not. 
Um, so those are like the little things. And also like, you know, when somebody does click on an email that might flag your AB or your EDR or something, understand why and what happened. Um, rather than just saying getting all the logs in one place, go, did we see it? If not, why not? And two, was it contained? And that person, let's say accounts, where they're used to getting lots of emails with attachments, that's quite normal. Or somebody who's never really got attachments, okay, so it's more targeted. I think very fine-tuned looking at those types of logs can help you understand a lot. And without overwhelming you, as I said, because otherwise, like, there are so many logs out there that you could configure that eventually will just drown you. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I don't think I mentioned this before, but I, I used to do incident response and digital forensics for, for the audience's sake of knowledge. And so I can't agree more with, with configuration and logging specific things. And after the incident happens is the worst time to realize that something that could have helped solve the case is not being logged anymore um, or it never was logged to begin with. And so those kinds of things are really helpful to get squared away beforehand. Um, and I mean, one of the notable things I always found was like security logs, right? A lot of forensics is just log analysis, like probably more than 50% of it. And if you give 30 seconds of a security log, it's probably not going to uh, glean much information. And then the other thing I, I always say is like, you know, if you're only logging things, for example, like successful logins, right, but you're not logging failed logins, um, if they're logging in a thousand times and failing, but they get in the once, it might be helpful to know that they're failing a thousand times so that you have uh, an account lockout policy in the next next round so that they don't actually have the ability to log in a thousand times. And I have seen that like thousands of times. It's, it's scary. <laughs> Um, Debbie, what, uh, what thoughts do you have on, on that? Well, what Daniel was describing, I was thinking about it as, you know, it's basically indicators of attack, indicators that you are under attack. And um, I would say, you know, during our incident, um, we discovered there were important systems for which we were not collecting security logs and we were, of course, not monitoring them. Um, and it was true at the time for the logs that were being created by our domain controllers. And so the first step of the CDOT attack involved basically a password cracking activity in which 40,000 invalid passwords were attempted before that initial system that was broken into was compromised. Um, so these were indicators of attack that had we had some sort of alerting that this was going on, we could have stopped the attack. But because we were not capturing, we were not monitoring that data, we had no idea we were under attack until it was much too late. Um, so as Adnan stated, make sure you're capturing logs from your most important systems at a minimum and not just capturing logs, but that you have some type of alerting going on for when something normal, like a mistyped password, goes way beyond normal, like 40,000 mistyped passwords. And obviously not everyone can do their own monitoring. So this can easily be outsourced to a partner who can then alert you or potentially even take action themselves to, to stop that attack. I feel like we need a clippy with AI that says, hi, I've noticed that you're getting a brute force attack on your server. Would you like me to? Maybe that's something we can collectively ask Microsoft to fix because yeah, that, that could be useful. Yeah, absolutely. Um, for sure. <laughs> and you know, it's not unusual. I mean, what I found when I looked at, deeper into this is that intentionally our teams were not collecting those uh, domain controller logs because they're noisy, they're chatty. There's a lot of data streaming and we don't necessarily have storage for that. And so you do have to kind of be thoughtful about what logs are we gonna collect? And then how do we make sure that we're not just collecting and storing these chatty logs, but that we have some sort of intelligence going on so that we're doing something useful with them, um, not just collecting them without purpose. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so there's a couple of quick questions we'll, we'll, from the audience that we'll take. They actually were from the um, phone tree discussion. Actually, one of them was for you, Daniel. So um, 
what uh, about channels that give updates to all participants immediately for instead of cell phones and uh, phone cell phones and phone trees how about a channel that gives updates what are your thoughts on that it's probably not fashionable to say it anymore uh, but whatsapp i found to be incredibly powerful in incidents because most people have it on their phone um, and once you've got those phone numbers you can put them into a group and go from there um, we did say Signal. Signal makes it a lot harder due to the way that the crypto has been architected to add and remove members. So we found WhatsApp with a group leader or admin, similar to like you have with your parents' networks where they send you horrible messages all the time and you can mute. Um, we found, especially in a lot of instance, WhatsApp was a, a real winner and very easy and cheap. Yeah. Does anyone have any other thoughts on that question? I use Slack quite a bit. Um, I think, you know, regardless of what you use, you just need to kind of decide ahead of time. Um, because obviously, if you're in the middle of an incident, it's hard to get folks to sort of stop and trade phone numbers and implement, you know, download an app. And <laughs> so yeah. you just kind of have to decide ahead of time. Yeah, I, I think the other thing to keep in mind, too, is like the we didn't talk too much about it, but like the PR aspect of during an incident, right? And so making sure that whatever you're using is secure so that if there is a leak somewhere, <laughs> well, that there's not a leak. Um, because I think that that is really one of the biggest things. And I think Daniel, when we talked previously is like, you know, people are so afraid to report because they're afraid of being shamed or the repercussions of, you know, fines and all that stuff. And, but on the other hand, if we don't ever report it, we, we're not going to grow and learn from it um, as a whole, I think. So, just to, to touch on that. Adnan, did you have anything to add? No, no, I, I agree. I agree with, uh, with the rest of the panelists. Great. Um, okay, so we have, uh, actually, we have one more question. Yes. Uh, so there was talk of network, network diagrams. Do any of the panel have an example of the types of things that are most likely to save us in the event of a horrible attack? Any thoughts on that? I'd love it if we made more network diagrams. We seem to have forgotten that we should be doing this. I don't know why, maybe it's just my experience, but the age old network diagram of this is there and that's that seems to have gone out the window. And I think it still helps a hell of a lot, especially let's say, all right, we've lost our backup server, our email server, our comm server. Okay, what's left? You know, it, it relies on maybe a core group of people going from memory saying, well, actually that box over there. I think there's a lot to be said like, about good old fashioned network diagrams so everybody understands the path, what connects where, simple things like IP addresses. You know, if you lose the network, does everybody know what IP addresses of the servers were? Little things like that. Yeah, absolutely. I think an inventory uh, too is super important. There's so many times where we would have an incident and say, okay, what, what system is this? And they just look at like a deer in headlights. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> It's like, okay, well, we need to track down that system. And nine times out of 10, it was either a system that was you know, not used anymore or externally facing that somebody just scanned and got an open port or had an account that they compromised and um, you know, they just got lucky because it was dormant or you know, not used anymore and, and kept active. So all, uh, all things that could not end well. <laughs> All right, so we have about 10 minutes left. Um, we're going to do a little bit of round robin. So whoever wants to go first, uh, I was going to ask, are there any resources in either the public or private sector that can help uh, in the wake of an incident, and preferably for small businesses since the blueprint is really geared towards them? Who wants to go first? So I, I, I can go first. I mean, I. Uh... When I was at GCA, I was running the, the small business toolkit. And when we were at CIS, I was working on the critical controls advisor board. The and we get we get this question asked all the time, right? It's like give us the give us the sort of silver bullet. Give us the, the give us the things that we need to do so that we're not wasting time and we are really getting the bank for our buck. Well, I mean we got critical controls. Right. Start there. Start implementing the first five. Don't jump around. Don't follow the shiny ball. Start doing the first, yeah. you know, first five, six critical controls. If you're not doing those, 
absolutely nothing is going to be able to help you. If you're not doing the first five, six critical controls and you're just jumping around and following this vendor's talk and you're just, you know, deploying devices or getting services, but you are missing the foundational things, you are going to fail. Yeah. So if you want to know the, the couple things that are going to save you before the incident and during the incident, go with the critical controls. Have that your guideline because critical controls have analyzed thousands and thousands of incidents incidents that are similar to the incidents that you're going to be facing you know maybe tomorrow maybe next week and they boiled down the response efforts and controls and said okay if if we did this first five things we could have prevented 80 87 percent of the attacks who would know you know so Cybersecurity is not complicated. Don't let other people make it sound like it is complicated. It is not. Do, you know, follow the guides of CIS. Go with the critical controls. They are extremely valuable. They work. And then after doing some of them, you know, first five, first six, first seven, then depending on your capabilities, you may have the luxury of following some of the shiny ball because... Your IT department wants them so far. But, but, you know, do the critical controls. I would start there, and I cannot stress the importance of the critical controls. Yeah, yeah. I tell people go to Center for Internet Security, um, so www.cis, or sorry, cisecurity.org. Um, there's tons of resources there, including the critical security controls that add non references. So just tons of resources to help, you know, benchmark yourself, figure out how to start. Um, and then those controls and get started with that. I, I agree. It's get back to the basics. Let's do the basics right. Um, and it will also prevent you from chasing the shiny object because there's no silver bullet. It really is about getting the basics right. Yeah, absolutely. Daniel? Stop running your own exchange service. It's impossible, right? I'm telling you now, it's a monster with nine heads. Let Microsoft deal with that suffering and your life will be much better. All right, well, thank you for that advice. Uh, it's certainly beneficial. Um, I think the other thing, and I'll, I'll kind of offer, you know, is to piggyback on what Adnan and uh, Debbie said about CI security. Obviously, I'm a little biased because I work there, but <laughs> I cannot stress enough when I worked in MSI SAC, I mean, they would offer free, or they still do, free incident response and digital forensics for state and local governments. I, I mean, that's huge, right? I mean, if you look at the cost of hiring a consultant to do that work, it's, it's you know, yeah. expensive. It's uh, not cheap. So, so uh, uh, all right. So let's go to the last last question that I have for you guys. How do you see the threat landscape progressing over the next few years? And uh, how much in terms of defense will change, do you think, as we face new threats that may not be in ransomware? Who wants to go first? All right, taking a stab. Um, I think what we're seeing from a, a manufacturing and operating system level, there were definite gaps in how things have been made. I, I find it hard in 2022, it's still trivial to own a machine via a click from an email or browsing the thing. I think that's the hardest thing. And I think if you look at the efforts that's going into latest versions of operating systems, there are attempts at making that very, very hard. That's at least a good thing. The second thing is that the law enforcement is actually getting better at going off these criminals. Um, that was always kind of their first big thing is that, well, I'm based in Belarus or Estonia and I'm attacking some in the US. Good luck. Good luck getting some kind of multiple jurisdiction groups coming after me. Well, actually, no, we are seeing a lot of wins in that space. And I think thirdly, awareness. You know, you touched on that earlier that before people were quite afraid to admit they've been attacked. And I think that was wrong because there's there's almost nothing wrong with admitting that you've been attacked, right? It, it's 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 ugly, it's embarrassing. You know, your laundry's been put out on the street, but the reality is is that 
we've still not really built a defendable internet. And I think that's where, you know, myself, I include myself in this, is that we need to get better at making an operating system where people can click stuff because that's what people have to do, right? They shouldn't have to go, oh, is it a fake email? Will it open up a reverse shell? No, you should be able to click something and for the various controls and various layers of that onion go, I know what to do because it's trying to open up this, I'm going to stop it from happening. I think for me, that's where I'll see a, a significant shift in the next couple of years. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. I, I saw that Interpol actually released their first um, report this, I think it was just last week or maybe a few weeks ago. And uh, it's nice to see that kind of information and collaboration like on an international level because it is, it's, you know, it's difficult and it's been a hurdle, but um, hopefully we're breaking down some barriers. Uh, Debbie, how about you? What, what are your thoughts? Well, I work for CrowdStrike and we are tracking more than 180 adversary groups. So these are, you know, groups that are attacking all of us. Um, and when I first started a year ago, we were tracking 160. So it continues to grow and escalate. We are not seeing cybercrime slow down at all. And what we are seeing is that most cybercrime is financially motivated where the attackers are um, as Daniel said, um, attacking system insecurities, and they're doing so uh, in order to, you know, make money. Um, ransomware is the big thing right now. Something else we're seeing is um, where the criminal groups are uh, threatening to release your data. So they make a copy of your data first, and then they threaten to release your data unless you pay them an extortion fee. And so they're asking for two fees. So one to decrypt your data and one to prevent them from releasing it. So what we are seeing is these groups are just looking for ways to make money um, and systems are very insecure. And so again, we've got to figure out how to make our systems more secure. Um, and do it in a sort of a defense in depth strategy, as Daniel also mentioned, um, because these attackers are, are, you know, they're increasingly coming after us, whether we're big entities or small entities, this is a problem we're all, we're all suffering from. Yeah, it, it's interesting that you said that, because in one of the reports I read this morning, actually, it said that a lot of criminal groups are starting and then shutting down quicker, because they don't want to get caught, obviously. And so therefore, there. I wonder if that's also adding to the, the just the sheer number of, you know, different groups, but they're actually using the same techniques and related to, to one another. So it's definitely an interesting point. Um, Adnan, what are your what are your thoughts on that? So, I mean, you, you mentioned about the change in trend, I mean, threat landscape. And, you know, I, I think I'm going to get a lot of haters for this, but I'm mean, threat landscape is not changing. Threat landscape is not changing, and let me let me sort of unpack that. No, they uh, I, uh, maybe I mean you guys know about this person. I mean his name was uh, uh, Bill Salton, right? Uh, he was a famous bank robber. He was asked why he was rob robbing banks, and he said, "Well, that's where the money is, right?" So that's the fine. I mean because the, I mean the reason there is an increase in financial crime in 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 cyberspace is because that's where the money is. Right, that that and this is going to happen. But if you look at for the last twenty years, if you look at the most common cyber attacks, biggest failures, they are still the same: phishing, malware, weak passwords, lack of multi-factor authentication. People are not backing up. Back backup is not a new thing. We've been talking about backups in late nineties. Yeah. We are still talking about backups. So it is, uh, you know. So that landscape is, I think the sector is driven by, um, you know, this is a, you know, capitalist market, right? Every year we have to come up, we have to come up with new threats, right? That, that's what, that's what the sort of the sector is forcing us to do. Oh, you know, threat landscape is changing. This is changing. And this is why you need this new latest and greatest thing. Well, yes, I mean, yes, you may, but, you have to do patching still. You have to do updates. You have to do multi-factor authentication. You have to do backups. Now, if, you, if you do this first, I think as a as a as a community, we have to focus on this, and that's what critical controls are focusing. That's what GCA is focusing. You know, when you look at the the road, uh, ransomware roadmap, that's what you guys are focusing as well. 
because that's what works. Uh, so I think for the next five years, threat landscape is not going to change significantly for a normal person, for a normal organization. You know, yes, for, you know, organizations that are doing advanced research, they may get this sort of, you know, cut of the edge technology and they may, you know, they may get attacked with, you know, uh, this very edge vulnerability. But normal person, normal organization, they are still going to get hit by these common things that we've been seeing for the last uh, 20 years. So let's focus on that. Let's do the basics first and then worry about the, you know, changing of the landscape and, and, uh, and advanced attacks. Amen. I completely agree. I, uh, <laughs> I could not agree more, Adnan. I, I'm actually with you. I think that for the most part, the threat landscape won't drastically change, right? They'll still get in via RDP until we do something about it. They'll still get in via phishing because it's a human element that's at hand. So I think you're right, right? It's go back to the basics, um, which I know that we are at time. So I'll, I'll offer one last piece of information, which is why we're all here today is to talk about the blueprint. So if you haven't downloaded it already, please do so. Um, and those links will be provided, I believe in the, the uh, chat. And um, yeah, so if you if you have time to check it out, please do. And um, just start with the basics, because that's really where it's at, and then work up from there. So thank you very much for everyone uh, who's listening, and also to our panelists. I really appreciate all of your input. We had great information um, and an awesome hour jam-packed with some some tips and tricks that hopefully everyone will have some takeaways and uh, get to work. So I'm signing off now, and uh, bye. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, everyone. Take care.